All right. He wrote The Victory Machine, The Making and Unmaking of the Warriors Dynasty. House of Strauss is his podcast. Uh, erudite, smart, self-aware. We love Ethan Strauss. So let's let's so let's go to that because you were covering that Warriors team, and there was there, you could feel it before it happened. Draymond, first of all, is confrontational. KD's not, so that wasn't perfect. Kerr can use volume. He can be confrontational. So before, do you remember that 2019 year? Did you feel like there were there was pressure and they were rushing KD back a little? I felt like they were. I felt like he wanted to come back because if you remember, Colin, what happened when he was out, certainly they wanted him to return, but the Warriors just got more beloved without him. It was what so many basketball fans wanted. They wanted a team where it didn't feel stacked, where it didn't feel decadent. And I believe if they had pulled it off and they had won without him, which they still could have done potentially, if not for Clay Thompson tearing his ACL, um, it would have been a bit of a mark against him. So there was this external pressure. I know he would disagree. I know he would say that we're full of it, that he just wanted to return because he wanted to return. But there was a lot of outside noise, and it's very difficult to know what the right decision should have been, but it did not feel like the right decision, even if when he had just drained a bunch of three-pointers and the Warriors were up on the Raptors in his return game. A championship felt so inevitable and man i've never seen a stadium more despondent than that toronto crowd at that moment before it all came undone for the warriors so we both watched women's college basketball now i've made the argument that the ratings were massive in 83 but the quality of the product was not as good so when cheryl miller jettisoned college basketball it went back to being really a second class citizen compared to other basketball like nba or men's college basketball but the quality of women's basketball now is very good. Generations of young ladies being encouraged to be athletes. The system is better. The play is significantly better. But I, it is a phenomenon. Caitlin Clark is a phenom. And in phenoms like Tiger and MJ, trees don't grow to the sky. I, I think it will come down. Let's start with this, though, Ethan, because this is the kind of thought piece that you specialize in. Why... Did we see such a massive surge this year with Caitlin? Well, I think they were in the right position for it to happen. It was it was Caitlin Clark. What did you say that it wasn't that she was riding a wave or they were riding a wave? She was the wave. I right. mean, it's incredible. Those final four games, the one that featured her, got twice as many viewers as the other one against it. So there's a huge component of it being her. But if you look at women's college basketball it's been very stable um in its viewership where the final gets around five million six million for years and years and years as a lot of other properties and leagues are declining in popularity i think it has an advantage over some of these other leagues one of them is the familiarity factor where the women stay four years because the salaries in the WNBA are comparatively meager and then we get used to them and they become these brands. Yeah. And that's something that you don't even see certainly as much in the men's college game because of one and done, but also obviously in the NBA in the player empowerment era where we've seen so many guys, Kyrie Irving, what teams he on uh, James Harden bouncing around Kawhi Leonard. They're all men without a country. And then speaking of country, Colin, I think this is the most underrated factor in my opinion. I think it's underrated because the people who make decisions, executives, they're not the most nationalist people. They travel a lot. Uh, their passports are well used. But a lot of people in the United States, the country, nationhood, these things matter to them. And these players in women's college basketball are, by and large, from America. And there are trade-offs. It's no slight. It's not uh, Jokic's fault that he's a prodigy and he's from Eastern Europe. But there's a barrier of entry. It's harder to get to know him yeah. for the American customer yeah. than it is to get to know Caitlin Clark. So I think those factors, the familiarity factor and also just the American factor, yeah. those are two that are differentiating it and helping it have this huge moment with Caitlin Clark. Yeah, no, we we largely agree. It's it's you know, um it's it's interesting how NIL and the transfer portal were seen as sort of enemies of college sports. I would argue, I saw a story today where the Ravens general manager, the Baltimore Raven GM Eric DaCosta said the NIL is actually going to keep college players in college longer. And I thought, what a win 
for college football that NFL guys are going to stay in college. And I think actually, and this is the way the world works, change freaks people out. And so our initial reaction to change is, whoa, 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 I don't like. I can remember when the speed limit changing was a national discussion for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the transfer portal in the NIL, could you argue the NIL will save college basketball, not hurt it? I think you could certainly argue that. Um, you want it maybe to be a little less player empowerment-esque in the NBA. You don't want guys changing teams all the time, but I think the payment, uh, the payment, I think has been good. I think it's professionalized it. I think a lot of people, as you were saying, were freaked out about the whole thing and it was all going to come unraveled. It's been the opposite. Nobody, Colin, five years ago would have predicted this college football boom. I don't think anybody was saying, you know, the sport of the future, it's college football. And yet it seems to be happening. Even with the dissolution of all these conferences and things people hold dear, they're really into it. And I think the increased professionalization, for whatever reason, has worked for college football. It's worked for women's basketball. And I do think it's worked for men's basketball as well. I think the narrative is a little bit off. Yeah, the women's game got viewed more than the men's game. It means something. But then again, the men's game was on cable TV. The women's game was on network TV. Yeah. I think college basketball right now, it's fine. And it might be in a good spot currently to grow and to harness some of this new world order that they've created with NIL. You know, um, Michael Jordan, uh, smartly or not, was apolitical. Um, whereas LeBron, and maybe it's a cultural change or just his personality, he was very reticent to go into politics. If you read uh, early book, Jeff Benedict, a book on LeBron, he didn't want to go into politics, and then the Trump stuff happened, and he did. But he's a little more political, more willing to engage in racial discussions. And because that's polarizing, he'll never be quite as popular or worshipped, I believe, as MJ. Although I think he basically, as a basketball player, does virtually everything better or at a higher level. And it's interesting, so there's this polarized, magic wasn't polarizing, I don't think Dr. J was, MJ wasn't, Shaq wasn't, LeBron is. And so when his son announces he may enter the NBA draft, there's pushback. And my argument this week is, you ever seen a plumbing truck? They always say Johnson and Sons. This is what we do. When I started a business, I leaned into friends and people I knew. I'm not bothered in the weakest draft in years taking brawny if you're the lakers at 55 an athletic young guy who can shoot a little how do you think it'll play if it happens yeah i think that's a great point by the way and i think the media hasn't exactly been honest and this is going to be the theme of our discussion colin is trade-offs right you can internationalize your game as the nba and mlb have and get more popular around the world but the trade-off is maybe americans aren't going to like it as much you can be political. Maybe that's what you fervently believe and you feel like it's your moral duty. But the trade-off is you might not be as popular. I don't think the media has been honest about it. And that's a factor we didn't even mention with Caitlin Clark, where she's been tap dancing through a rainstorm without getting wet, uh, being a neutral party and not commenting on anything particularly fraught. And it seems like there's a hunger for that out there. And a lot of people want that kind of thing. Uh, LeBron wasn't that exactly. He got into the culture war at a very heightened time. And I think even worse than that, this is a subtle point. I just don't think he was very good at it. I think that other people who got into that space just seemed like they were more authentic and they had more to say. And it almost seemed like it was a way of trying to leapfrog Mike by being more important and being more like Ali. And this is what I heard from you know, people around Nike, and it seemed like a marketing ploy. And so not only did you have people offended because they're just going to be offended on the basis of politics, there was an aspect of fakeness to it. And then it leads to what you're talking about, which is people start getting mad at you for things that ordinarily they might shrug off and not care about, such as your son being a second rounder or whatever and joining the team. Look, it's weird. I don't think it's any occasion to be angry about it. I just think it's a very odd story if his son isn't up to the NBA level and he's on an NBA team, but it certainly doesn't morally offend me. I want to go back finally because you're really good at Kevin Durant, and Kevin would get upset with you, but I always feel like Kevin actually is paying you respect when he acknowledges you because that means he read you and he's not brushing you off. And, and Durant has often said he likes to go into battles on Twitter. He likes to connect with people. And so last night, the Suns were down 35-4 to four at home. That, that, that's like a high school mismatch. 
And years ago, when people got into this, KD is better than LeBron, I said, time out. I said, to me, LeBron is foundational, whereas, you know, KD is just a beautiful new kitchen. <laughs> They're both great. Mm. But one guy I can yeah. build completely around offense, defense, coaching, leadership, calling you at home, leader on the plane. Another guy is just a shot maker. The Phoenix story for both J-Mac and I, we both whiffed on it. Did you have a sense that despite Booker and Beal and KD, did you have a sense it wouldn't be as rosy as many of us project that it would be? It's funny. In a way, it's even rosier than I thought it would be. I thought it would be uh, far more contentious and there would be a lot more drama. In a way, it just seems like there's not a lot of drama. The on-court product is what's disappointing out there. And... Yeah, it, it's one of these mercenary squads, and this gets into the broader conversation about the NBA. Not only do the organic, uh, the organic teams, the drafted cores, that's what people want to see. I also think that's that's typically what's better. You know, there are exceptions; we can find them. But the Suns squad, it just feels a little bit too much like pickup basketball. Yeah, I don't know. Nobody held a gun to my head and asked for any sort of prediction on the Suns, but I would say that. I am not surprised by the difficulties they're having. Um, and if anything, they've exceeded expectations in certain respects, such as Kevin Durant's level of play at this age yeah. after the injuries. It's incredible. But it's no surprise to me that the whole is not greater than the sum of its parts. I think that was almost guaranteed when this whole thing came together. So it's called House of Strauss. Google it. Look it up. I am a listener regularly, always engaging. Uh, very thoughtful. We love bringing him on, Ethan Strauss, who is uh, a guy that never stops working or thinking. And it's good seeing you again, my man. Oh, it's excellent seeing you, Colin. Thanks so much. Ethan Strauss. Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more, wherever you may be, however you may be watching. Thanks again for making us part of your day.